Just what happens when you've collected the eggs? How soon are they met with the sperm? Well, what happens is it, it depends on the quality of the sperm from the partner of the recipient. So if it's just going to be straightforward IVF, which is the sort of classic test tube baby treatment that was developed for Louise Brown's birth, then all that has to be done is the sperm has to be prepared um, and will be mixed with the eggs at about, well if the egg collection's at say half past eight, we'll mix the eggs and the sperm at half past three in the afternoon. And so the eggs will sit in the lab in an incubator. We've got a lot of incubators obviously. So each each donor's eggs will be put into a dish allocated to the recipient and will sit in a nourishing, warm environment of moist, warm air until they're ready to be inseminated. So with IVF, we just concentrate the vigorous, moving, healthy sperm into a really concentrated suspension and add a tiny droplet of that to each drop of fluid containing the eggs. And the sperm will swim around overnight and one of them will penetrate each egg, hopefully, and fertilise it. What do they grow into before they're put into the recipient? Do they call it a blastocyst? No, no. What happens is the egg embryo doesn't actually grow at all. It stays the same size for the first five days of development. And in those five days, well, we can put the embryo back into the womb of the recipient any point between fertilisation and the end of those first five days. Because there's something very special about mammalian embryos, but the egg itself is coated with a sort of gelatinous coating, and it's we think that that is there as part of this very special thing about the human embryo, which is that it's a free-floating entity, or the mammalian embryo, I should say. It's a free-floating entity for those first five days, and that's the time that it's it's released from the ovary as an egg and becomes fertilised and it trundles down the fallopian tubes. You know, you've got your two fallopian tubes. It trundles down the fallopian tubes, stays the same size, still coated in this outer coating, protected. And the cells divide during that process of its little journey down to the into the womb. And each division, the cells halve in size. So the embryo is called a cleavage stage embryo because those divisions are called cleavage divisions rather than the divisions of the cells, the rest of the cells in your body, where you end up with a cell sort of grows and then divides and you end up with two cells the same size as the original cell. With your embryo, it's the same size for five days. The cells get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller until a little ball of cells arrives in the womb and that's the blastocyst at five days. But we can put the embryo back into the into the womb with IVF treatment at any point during those first five days. After five days, between six and seven days, the embryo is called a hatching blastocyst. It bursts out of that outer coating and that's the point at which a pregnancy really can begin because you've got the cells of the embryo emerging from this protective coating and they're literally naked cells against the naked cells of the uterus and you get that burrowing into the lining of the womb in the beginning of a pregnancy, and that's called implantation. And when when and where, because the eggs get graded as well? The eggs don't tend not to get graded. Certainly here we don't grade them no. because, remember I mentioned this blob of jelly-like cells, that you can't really see the egg unless you can strip away those cells. So if you're doing ICSI, yeah. you do strip those cells away and you can look very closely at the naked egg. But with IVF, you leave the cells around the egg, so you can't really tell what it looks like. The following day, when you come in to look for fertilisation, so you can see whether the egg's fertilised the day after the egg collection. The DNA, the genetic material from the sperm, mixes with the genetic material from the egg, and it initially, it's, it literally looks like two craters in the middle of the egg. That's on day one. And then um, later on, on day one, those two sets of genetic material fuse to form one unique set of genes that's the new genetic material of a new individual. And um, then later on, on that same day, the first cleavage division will happen. And, um, and then the, over the next few days, it goes from two cells to four cells to eight cells and so on. Do you know the moment the person who's retrieving the eggs does the collection? Are you ready there and waiting? To the, the, the most important thing, or one of the most important things throughout the whole process is making sure that we 
minimize any damage that we might cause to the eggs because they're precious, precious eggs and each one is the potential contribution to a new family for the recipient. So what we must do is maintain the environment around the eggs as close to what's inside your body as possible. And the way we do that is we keep everything at body temperature, we minimize the exposure time to air, to the environment, to the temperature of room temperature. So yes, it's really important that an embryologist is on standby to collect the tubes of fluid that hopefully contain eggs from the donors and quickly examine them as fast as possible to get those eggs into the incubator where they can be kept warm. But every step of the way, we've got everything kept warm. So the surfaces of the microscope stages that we look down are kept at body temperature. Um, there is hot test tube blocks are heated to keep the tubes of fluid that come out of your ovaries at room temperature. So everywhere that does any kind of assisted conception treatment would would absolutely have to make sure that these sort of processes are possible with the minimum damage caused by fluctuations in temperature which can be very harmful. I suppose if you get into the role quite you know seriously it could be quite, it can be quite reassuring and quite exciting to come in the next day and see that you know the sperm has fertilized it's, and it's yes I mean on a daily basis it's it's something that we come in I mean the, it's one of the wonderful things about biology but also it's one of the tragedies in some cases that yeah. you can't predict even when you think everything is perfect there might be something that you haven't you don't even know about I mean have you physically contribute. watched it step by step and, and not you can't you can't actually see that the act of fertilization oh, yeah. even if, even with the time-lapse imaging that we have now which takes photographs of the embryo that's developing so you can play a video of the embryo dividing um, but to actually see the process of fertilization is such a long drawn out process it takes about 18 hours for the sperm to penetrate the egg so you've never physically so thought. even when you even when you carry out ICSI so you inject the sperm in you pull your injection needle out and you see the little sperm head sitting in the egg you could sit and watch it for hours and nothing would seem to happen so it all happens very very slowly with tongue wraps imaging, you can see the, the genetic material forming the little crater-like structures I told you about. You can see that forming, but you can't physically sit and watch it happen yourself. It's just too, too slow. <laughs> and also, we want to keep everything out of the incubator for as short a time as possible, because any, anything that's different from the environment of the body is potentially damaging, and there's an awful lot we don't understand. So we try and minimise any any changes that we subject the eggs and embryos to. Do you also look after the frozen embryos as well when recipients cho uh, choose to freeze? And how often are they checked, or are they just kept? No, no, no. Once once frozen, once an embryo is frozen, it will sit in liquid nitrogen undisturbed until it's needed. There's no point in checking them because literally the whole process of freezing is about putting them in a state of suspended animation. So provided you keep the liquid the liquid nitrogen topped up, they're in these big tanks. Um, provided they're submerged in liquid nitrogen, nothing's going to change because it's kind of absolute zero. No, no molecules are doing anything. They're all just sitting still. So the act of removing them has to be the act of Let's actively wanting to thaw them and use them, yes. With IVF, is it more common, as, as a mum of multiple himself, how how more common is it for multiples to be as, as a result of, of IVF treatment? Well, that's one of the um, concerns that are being addressed by responsible practitioners and actually the Human Fertilisation and Embryology Authority because they recognise that I think it was one in five or even more pregnancies resulting from IVF were twin pregnancies. But this is a few years ago now. But the simple reason is because to maximise the chances of a pregnancy people were putting back two, possibly three embryos. I mean, in the old, old days, people would put back eight, nine embryos, and you'd have these high order multiple pregnancies. So as everybody got better at doing IVF, we started to put back fewer and fewer embryos. And so it became common to put back two embryos and no more, um, except in possibly much older ladies. But even that carried with it this a high, high chance of twin pregnancy. So that's where the twin pregnancies come from because you put two embryos back. If both take, you have a twin pregnancy. 
So you've got about one embryo, you're going to reduce the chances of that happening. And that's what more and more centres are, are beginning to do. You what determines a good embryo? Pop Very good question. Um, this is actually the multi-million dollar question because nobody knows. We think we've got little signals and signs which draw us towards the better embryos. But they confound us all the time because we'll have people where we think these embryos are rather poor quality so to maximise the chance of pregnancy we better put two embryos back in this lady and lo and behold she surprises us all and turns up with twins. Equally we might put back what we consider to be the best embryo you could hope to see, textbook beautiful and so we say we only put back one embryo and the lady doesn't get pregnant.